with our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for this tremendous opportunity to study a word, to gather together as family in the unity of the faith. Father, thank you for reminding us of your sovereignty in this universe, that your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, controls history, and that we are merely players on a stage that glorifies you. Father, thank you, thank you for humbling us, and thank you for revealing to us your divine patience in our sanctification. We know we are stubborn fools at times, Father, but we know that you love us, and we love you for that. We pray for those still ill in the congregation and those that are still ill in the most severe way, that is, that they are lost. We are so grateful and thankful for your son's work on the cross to make an evening like this a reality. We do just ask for your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Um, this will be, as far as I can tell, again, the last installment of the series. It's almost amazing. As I was reflecting on the series, um, as I often do, as I'm frankly commissioned to do, it's almost amazing that we don't fully understand the following yet. And I speak for myself. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, Part B, the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. It's amazing that we don't fully understand that yet. We say we do. We like the idea of it, but we, haven't, we don't possess it fully yet. We don't grab hold of it yet. We aren't steadfast in it yet. So says our lives. So says our lives. The simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. I want to read a passage where Jesus himself helps us with this concept. Um, and as we read this passage, keep your mind's eye on two things specifically, namely humility and obedience. Humility and obedience. These being precursors, as we've learned, to peace. Go to John 14, 21. John 14, 21, again on the board, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, part B, the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Amazing that we miss it, that we don't have it, that we struggle with it. Uh, so says our lives. John 14, 21, keep your mind's eye on humility and obedience, those being, of course, the precursors to peace. Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him so right out of the gate I will love him and will disclose myself to him Jesus is talking about intimacy here intimacy so this comment from Jesus if we look at the context of the passage, it got one of his disciples questioning the nature of Jesus' own purpose in his incarnation. So remember, the Jews were looking for a Messiah, um, but they had no idea that he was going to choose to lay down his life for them as a perfect sacrifice. Remember, their perspective was quite skewed at the time as the result, or as a result, of all the misinformation that Jewish leaders had been propagating for years. And I was think that made me think, um, sanctification for Jewish disciples at that time, in their minds, would have included having to be delivered from their false hope, and therefore their false sense of peace. So if you think the way they were thinking, they thought of Messiah coming to deliver them, a king, a physical king that was going to rule. And Jesus said, that's not it at all. And so sanctification for the Jewish people at that time would have included being delivered from a false hope, even, and therefore a false peace. 
they believed the wrong things about their own Messiah. And just like it happens for anyone today who has been scarred, let's say, by errant religions or religious beliefs, I think of the dominant one here is Catholicism, of course. Um, anyone that's been scarred by something as heinous as Catholicism, the Word must patiently take His time to deliver them. Um, and that's what we see in context. We have misinformed individuals looking for one thing, but Jesus says something totally different. For example, as we'll see in a moment, Judas, not Iscariot, imagined a king and a ruler that would be seen by everyone. That was his false expectation, his false hope, and therefore the basis of his false sense of peace. You see, they would have said, oh, finally, the Messiah has come, and he's going to rule for us, and we're going to be vindicated, right? Because they were sort of outcasts uh, in terms of the Gentile population around them, uh, the Romans, etc. Um, and they were going to be, their expectation was deliverance in the physical sense, remember. That was the context that the average Jew would have been looking for. But that was a false hope because of a false expectation and therefore the basis of a false sense of peace. So Jesus had to explain to him, this Judas, that his kingdom was in essence spiritual and that subjects in his kingdom are members because of spiritual revelation. Up here on the board, faith alone is what establishes intimacy with Jesus. Faith alone is what establishes intimacy with Jesus. This would have been a very different concept for Judas and the other Jewish disciples who were waiting for a physical king. So I'm just trying to give you the context in here before we get into the rest of the passage. Up here on the board, being close to Jesus is a function of obeying and abiding in the Word of God. By faith. That's what we just read. We just read that. Being close to Jesus is a function of obeying and abiding in the Word of God. By faith. So this would have been, for lack of a better term, a mind-blowing thing to Judas, this Judas person. So Jesus takes the time to explain it. Now, look at verse 22. So Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord... What then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? You see, there, his expectation was, yeah, hoorah, right? We're going to, Jesus, our Messiah has come. We're going to have a king, and he's going to be, you know, remember in, in that day, kings represented the people, and every, every other people and every other kingdom knew of the kings over these kingdoms. And that's what they were, that's what Judas and the Jews were expecting was a physical king, someone to deliver them that way, to represent them publicly. And Jesus said, about as we're going to see, no, and this is what you see. Why are you going to, you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Now just keep in mind how simple and pure Jesus responds and how humility and obedience are the requisite features of said faith that establishes true intimacy with him and his father. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. It's about the most intimate thing you could possibly imagine, that the Godhead's going to make the, uh, its, abode, its abode within each one of us. We will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. Remember, humility and obedience in view. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And then look at where we end up in Holy Scripture. Huh. How often have we been to verse 27? Peace I leave with you. 
My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. So you see this sort of ramp up the context of that verse that we've been uh, quoting for weeks now. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. So make no mistake about it, Jesus has just described in brief what we've been studying for weeks now. That passage we just read, just a few short verses. He described pretty much what we've been studying from this pulpit for weeks now. He essentially said the humble seek the word, and when they find it, they keep it, obeying it. There's your humility and your obedience. Obedience leads to righteousness. And righteousness leads to peace. The peaceful fruit of righteousness. You see how simple it is? We can humble, seek to obey. Obedience leads to righteousness. Righteousness leads to peace. Why is he just so darn good at saying things? Scott, what was that, four or five verses? takes us weeks to do it. So to echo the opening thought about simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ, when we think about it, it's a riddle at times why we don't just humbly seek to obey, knowing that the greatest treasures of all, starting with Christ's peace, are the result. It's a riddle that we even complicate things it's not difficult in fact there is divine simplicity in all of this and it's not muddied or complicated rather it's pure our very deliverance and salvation aka our experiential sanctification depends on this perspective so says holy scripture up here on the board we saw this i believe on tuesday Psalm 91, 14 to 16. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. How do I save you? How do I go about delivering you? Not just salvation proper, but every day. God saves us every day. We are saved daily, right? We've learned this. We are saved daily. This is His salvation after all. On Sunday and Tuesday, the Spirit had us take pause with that short phrase, my salvation, His salvation from our perspective. A key phrase in the Bible that shows up many times For us in our recent messages, the Spirit's been using this phrase as a launching pad for some much-needed perspective as he inspired Paul to write, for example, up here on the board. Romans 8, 6. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Who has the power to deliver you? God's Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. The mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. When you're delivered, you have what? Peace. That's what it means to be saved daily. What did Jesus say? My Spirit is going to remind you, bring into remembrance all that I said to you. That same principle applies for all of us. The things we learn in the Bible, from the pulpit, from wherever, these are the things that the Spirit reminds us of. This is how we're delivered. This is how we're saved daily. However, the flesh says to us, this is my life, and therefore my salvation to architect. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me back in the 70s or the 80s, or whenever you got saved proper, thank you, thank you. But I'll take it from here. That's the flesh. Because i got a whole heck of a lot of living to do, you see. The flesh says, this is my life, and therefore my salvation to architect. Isn't it fair to say that one of our greatest weaknesses as human beings is to fall into the trap 
of believing that we can architect our own deliverance? Isn't that one of our great, I mean, maybe I'm the only control freak in the room. I doubt it because people are laughing already. I can see it in your eyes. This is what we try to do. We say, I'm good, I'm good, God. We stop praying. We don't see the need. Whoever says you just pray when you're in need? Seriously. What if the only thing you have to say to God is thank you and then you get up? How about that? Oh, really? I thought I only had to pray when I needed something. Sounds like an adolescent. Is it fair to say these things? That our greatest weaknesses are falling into the trap of believing that we can architect our own deliverance? Isn't that what we so often do in life? Isn't that what guides your decision making from day to day? We allow our flesh to take control over our thoughts and eventually our good perspective and then as a result ultimately our emotions. And then instead of being at peace we are anything but. At best we can fake it overtly. We fake it. We say I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Sometimes I scratch my head. I'm like, are you sure? Really? You don't seem too good. The Spirit's kind of bugging me. I mean, the Spirit kind of prompted me to, I don't know, reach out to you. How are you doing? He usually does that when something's going on. Or he often does it. Not always. Sometimes I just check in, tell you I love you. Some people are like, you never do that with me. Maybe you're just so perfect, you just don't need it. (laughs) Sometimes we fake it. And I know I sound like a broken record, but the surest way of being delivered from our own discordance, our lack of peace, is to remember His salvation. That's why we spent that time the last couple of lessons. Remembering this is His salvation. It's impossible for us to architect our own deliverance, our own salvation. It isn't until we lose sight of the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ that we begin to suffer experiential loss of peace. This is the same thing as saying the following things up here in the board. We lose experiential peace when we allow the flesh to dominate our perspective. Romans 8, 6. Stop rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. And try to architect our own peace. Isn't that the funniest thing? We lose peace when we try to take control of architecting our own peace. Romans 5, 10 to 11. We're already familiar with the first two. Um, so let's go, let's read the last. Go to Romans 5, 10. Romans 5, 10. We lose experiential peace. When we allow the flesh to dominate our perspective, stop rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks, and try to architect our own peace. This is when we lose experiential peace. Romans 5.10 For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Remember, we are saved daily. We are saved daily. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Again, the point of the board. We lose experiential peace when we allow the flesh to dominate our perspective. We stop rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks, and then also try to architect our own peace. We shall be saved by His life. This is His salvation. He says, this is my salvation to give. This is my peace that I give to you. These things come in pairs, as I talked about on Sunday. This is the perspective that the Spirit's been trying to give us. And it doesn't require deep philosophical reasoning to understand. In fact, as God would have it, it is quite simple. You can imagine a little drum roll right now. Here's all you have to say to yourself every morning, and you'll start each day well. You ready? This is a whopper. I am saved. 
That's it. Remind yourself of that every morning. I'm saved. I mean, you know, the kingdom of darkness can throw anything at me. Matter of fact, one of my kids just threw a Tonka toy at my head. And I'm not even out of bed yet. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I am saved. It's the biggest miracle you'll ever experience in life. That God chose to save you. That he elected you. That he wants to, to do those things. It's a phenomenal miracle that you're saved. But why is that so difficult to remember? To live in? To share? Why? That's the big question. Why is it so difficult then? Do we forget that we have been saved? Not by a process or a formula, but by a real person who loves us? Is that why we forget? Have we become doctrinally uh, sterile? Has salvation proper become something sort of gathering dust in our life from years ago? And we've stopped forgetting to give thanks for it? That we it just looks like a, you know, some kind of old crusty process that happened? But not an actual a person who's alive and still loves you to this day and can't wait to see you? Is that how that happens? I think so. I think that's how it happens. I think salvation becomes something sterile in our lives instead of actually being about a person who loves us enough so much that he died for us. That he took your place. It's kind of hard to forget that salvation, his salvation, when you think of it in terms of a person. That's the intimacy that Jesus was talking about. So this is why I love the two quotes we got on Tuesday evening from uh, Mr. Ravi Zacharias in a book, I guess it's called Why Jesus. I haven't read it. Our destiny is in a relationship to a person, not, a pilgrim, not in a pilgrimage to a place. Love it. I've been saying that for like years. This is not about a destination. Salvation is not a destination. Not, oh, I get my free ticket to heaven. This is a relationship. Our purpose is in communion with the living God, not in union with an impersonal idea or nameless high power. I love that point that came out on Tuesday, by the way. The fact that people don't like to give God a name because when you give someone a name, you know, even the scuzzy lawyers, when they defend God, Murderers, they'll say, don't refer to the victim by name. Because if you give him a name, he becomes real. He becomes relatable. You see, if you don't give God a name, if he's just some higher power in the ether, you don't have to relate to him anymore, you see. But if you give him a name, all of a sudden there's power in it. Hmm not in union with an impersonal idea or a nameless high power, such categorization is intellectual cowardice. It's almost like saying, I don't want to come face to face with the God of the universe. So he's going to remain nameless. <laughs> Again, that, all of that ought to sound very familiar because I've been preaching the same truth from the pulpit for years now. Only I'm not quite as exquisite in my language I say salvation isn't a destination. Same thing. I think even we believers can lose sight of the simple fact that we have been saved by a person. By a person. Not some cold process, not some doctrinal truth, although those things describe what happens at salvation, but by a real person. Our gratitude for our salvation is rightly directed towards the one who saved us, 
not the process by which he did so. Our gratitude for our salvation is rightly directed towards the one who saved us, not the process by which he did so. You know, theologians will argue till they're blue in the face about the process. Trust me, I have 150 books back there where everybody's talking about this and that, and even making up really long words about how, you know, election and predestination and all these really big words, and they fight and argue over these things, and it's like, not that it doesn't matter, but who the hell cares? Is this about a person? Or about all these forensic details that we get to learn about after we're saved? What is this about? What are we supposed to evangelize people with? A process or a person? What do we evangelize people with? Jesus or the facts about Jesus? Or the process? So our gratitude is towards a person, not the process. So I need you to concentrate. <clears throat> it's when we focus on the impersonal aspects of salvation that we risk suffering the loss of peace. This is what we've been learning. It's when we focus on the impersonal aspects of salvation that we risk suffering the loss of peace. The power of deliverance lies in the power of the Holy One, personally. If we ignore His power, Allah quench the Spirit, let's say, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, then we reject access to His peace. What's more comforting to dwell on? Ask yourself this. What's more comforting to dwell on? What engenders more peace in your soul? The process or the person of salvation? Which one brings you to peace? The process or the person of salvation? One more quote from Mr. Zacharias. Access to an abstract power gives you no one to be grateful to in times of blessing. And that, that kind of really drove home for me. If God remains nameless, who do you think? I think about all these support groups and stuff like that, and they talk about a higher power, and I'm not going to throw stones, but can we just say that the high power in the world is Jesus? Nope. Don't want to offend anyone. Well, that's funny because he's called the stumbling block and he had no problem offending anyone. So we're going to lie to people who are already downtrodden, who need him more than ever? We're going to lie to him and, and, and make God some nameless entity? That he's actually not a person? That a person doesn't actually save you? That you, with the help of some nameless higher power in the ether is what's actually going to deliver you in time? I'm sorry, that doesn't work. I, that's why I would, I'd be kicked out of every AA meeting. Nobody wants to hear about it. You see, this is a group, I'm not picking on anything, but there are lots of groups of people, self-help groups, that talk about higher powers, but not Jesus Christ. That's, as Zacharias would say, that's intellectual Cowardice. Access to an abstract power gives you no one to be grateful to in times of blessing. So who do you thank? If it's just some nameless higher power, who do you thank when you get delivered? Man, I've been, I've been sober for a month. I've been working hard. I've been on my 12 steps. I've been working hard. Me, 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 me. All the glory goes back to the, the, the individual, not to God, because, I mean, who's God? Some higher power. He's over there. No, he's over there. He's nameless. He's not even a person. Who, who are we thanking? The only person in the, that I can see in the mirror is me. <laughs> so I guess I'll take it. And the flesh is like, yes. Do you see how insidious it is? Access to an abstract power gives you no one to be grateful to in times of blessing. What a horrible thing. And no one to question and receive comfort from in times of sorrow. What a horrible thing. If you've got to look to some sterile process 
some step program to get you out of, to deliver you from pain and suffering? You, that's, what do you expect out of that? That's a human concoction. That's a manufactured human response to something spiritual. And it never works. You never find true peace. Because you're never really delivered. Because you have a false expectation, a false hope, and therefore a false sense of peace. Because it's all based on the flesh. Something architected by man. Remember the title of our message series is The Peaceful Fruit of Righteousness. And for weeks now, we've been investigating in Holy Scripture what God has to say about living in the peace that Jesus promised His disciples. What we found in a nutshell is that peace is the end product of sanctification. That's how we know we're being sanctified, right? We have more and more peace in our lives. So again, what we found is that peace is the end product of sanctification, and the prerequisite for sanctification is believing, a.k.a. having faith. Let me show you a verse that popped out to me while studying for you this morning. Go to Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13. This is what the Spirit's trying to say. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of hope fill you in believing. We're going to skip the middle piece. Fill you in believing. Up here on the board, that's from pleroo. Many of you remember that word for filling. Pleroo su en pistouo. In faith, in believing. Fill you in believing. That's what's written there. The attitude of trust is the necessary prerequisite condition of God's being able to fill a man's soul, and that God's being able to fill a man's soul is a necessary consequence of man's trust. McLaren. Again, let's read it again. I'll give you a little bit more insight on this because it's just so big. This verse, this one verse is just cram-packed. Verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you, pleuroo, su, with all joy and peace. There's the focus of our lessons over the past couple of weeks, in believing in pistouo, that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Whew! There's a lot, of, there's a lot going on in there. A, a lot. It's actually hard to express all that Paul's trying to convey here in one or two succinct sentences. In any case, the principles are very simple, and they ought to guide our very souls to peace itself. What we see is that peace really is the end product of sanctification. That's what he's saying. Peace is the end product of sanctification. And the prerequisite for sanctification is believing, a.k.a. pistouo, having faith. And as we've learned over the years, faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. And not only that, but it is understood that God gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6. You see these themes just keep running over? Remember the string of pearls I gave you at the beginning? Humility, obedience, righteousness, peace. Humility, obedience, righteousness, peace. Everybody wants this, but they don't want the middle part. They want this, but architect the middle by means of the human flesh. And a perfect example is what I just gave you when I was picking on AA, for example. I know their hearts are right. I'm not judging anyone. But what are you going to do if you're telling somebody to architect their own salvation? What are you actually setting them up to do other than to have false expectations and therefore false hope and therefore a false sense of peace? Let's stop lying to people. Let's stop lying to ourselves. All of this is impregnated into our current verse. Look at verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing 
so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Whew. I could read that ten more times and still not get all of it. The net net, though, is, for tonight's discussion, at salvation we are made positionally righteous, therefore we have been placed in a position to receive Christ's peace. Being saved daily, we are experientially made righteous, therefore we are able to receive His peace in time. We closed on Sunday by contemplating the symptoms of a much deeper, more insidious issue. That issue is arrogance, which usurps God's sovereign right to be who He is. At the end of the day, why is it that we struggle with the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ? Why is it that we would struggle with something as simple as, you know, Humility, obedience, righteousness, peace. Why do we walk around knowing what we know? Some of you have been at this for decades. What is the problem? Why do you not have all peace at this point? <laughs> what is the problem? What is the recurring theme in your life? Arrogance. God says, I'm sovereign, I'm Lord. You say, nope. Thanks for the salvation. I'll see you in a few. But for now, I'm Lord. This is my domain. I go to my house. I go to church. Okay, okay, okay. I'm subservient at church. I go. I, you know, I prostrate myself. I pray. I just, but then at home, no, -uh, it's me, the dog, my husband, my kids. Um, uh, I don't know. Hulu. Netflix. Beer. Uh, games. We fit. Leo, see, I'm striking a nerve. That's why he's losing all his weight. Everybody know, doesn't know his secret. God says, I'm sovereign. You don't get to say in any part of your life, oh, no, 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 I, I reserve this little area over here. You know where I'm growing tomatoes and peppers? It's my little area. I've, you know, it's my little garden. And I water it with my own form of delivery, my own, what, power? God, you stay out. I've got to have this one little thing. No. God says, I'm sovereign. I'm God over all. Let me be who I am in your life. A person who denies God of his sovereignty will never have peace. His son won't give it to them. It's that simple. He basically says, if you, if you obey me, my commandments, then you can have my peace. Humility, obedience, righteousness, peace. If you obey me, I'll give you my peace. But if you don't, sorry. What do you expect? That's that dipsukos idea. Double-mindedness. Double-souled, if you would. Living two lives. Anybody ever do that in here? You have this church life, and then you have this life. You leave church, you're a different person. Hmm. That's why you lack peace. At least be honest. So you, his, our Lord won't give it to us if we're playing that game. A person who demands that they deliver themselves unto their own salvation won't have peace. And even a believer who attempts to sanctify his or herself is living in what can only be called futility. Futility. So, with that said, we need to come full circle with this series and prepare to close it out. Remember, the title of this series is The Peaceful Fruit of Righteousness. That's what we've been studying. In doing so, I'm going to borrow principles from our previous lessons and see what the Spirit says to each of us. So we're just coming out of the mine shaft now. We're looking at the writing on the wall. As we went down, you know, we drew pictures on the wall. We're coming back out. You know, I remember that. Our series began the way it is now ending, with simplicity. 
we started with this, if you remember. 1 John 5, 17, part A. All unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. If it's not right before God, <laughs> then it's a sin. As we saw in Holy Scripture, there is no peace in sin. They are mutually exclusive domains. There's no peace in sin. Jesus Christ was perfect. He had perfect peace. There's no sin in there. There's no peace in sin. So if you're living in sin, to whatever degree you're doing that thing, there will be no peace. To the degree that you're delivered from those things experientially, you will have peace. That's what the Spirit's been teaching us. Unrighteousness equals sin equals discord. In other words, a lack of peace. What we've learned is that peace is the result of our Lord's promise to give it. My peace I leave with you, John 14, 27. However, we've also learned that such promises are conditioned experientially upon our obedience. And we saw all this scripture. Lesson one. All these things were conditioned on our obedience. The question then begged, yes, but what does all this mean? I mean, on a more practical level. Well, we saw what Jesus taught up here on the board, Luke 9.62. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That doesn't, that's not talking about salvation proper. That's talking about service. No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You will cut a crooked furrow. In other words, to use the farmer's analogy, if you were to turn around after you've been off the wagon, you fell off the wagon for a little while, you look behind and you're going this way and you're in someone else's line and you're messing up this guy and then you next day mess up, not to mention your own. That's the practical side. That's what it means. Fitness in the spiritual life, as we've seen, is a function of obedience. If our master says, put your hand on the plow and go that way, I'm calling you. Come on, come this way. And you keep turning your head to the left and to the right and cutting a crooked furrow, well, you get what you get. I'm trying to bear good fruit in your life. But if you're a terrible farmer, fruit, the crop's going to be a little low this year. Obedience is a requisite element of abiding in peace. Up here on the board, peace from obedience. If we want peace, we must obey God's commands. Obedience implies very practical lifestyle choices, not just mental assent to obedience. While we can't fake it till we make it, we can at least humble ourselves, learning humility through life itself. God gives faith, Romans 12.3, that leads to obedience, that leads to peace. What we've been given is a string of pearls by which we can live by. And when we obey Him, receiving the Spirit's guidance, we bear fruit that is in keeping with His promises, such as, my peace I leave with you. When we obey, when we're righteous, and it leads to peace. Up here on the board, encouraging fruit. Many of you remember this principle. A lot of scripture behind this one. Fruit is a practical device that God uses to prove to us that He is actually sanctifying us. I mean, how else are you going to know? Seriously, how else are you going to know? If there's not fruit, the inverse that Jesus taught was if there's no fruit, you get a problem. How about in your life? What's the most encouraging thing for you? To see fruit in your own life. It may be a very intimate moment between you and the Lord. You may be praying to God, thank you for that you've revealed this thing to me because two weeks ago or two years ago or 20 years ago, I'd have been flipping out. I would have lost all semblance. I would have been a mess. I would have been on, on some emotional roller coaster for weeks if this thing had happened back then. And here it is, and I'm at peace. I have at least some calm, some stability much, much more than I would have otherwise. Peace is a primary fruit of righteousness. That's why. That's why. If, he say, if God says don't return evil with evil, but return evil with good, that's the command, right? 
If you run off and turn evil to evil, you're going to have a problem. You don't, that's not righteous. Therefore, the peace you have is gone. You would have had is gone. If you overcome evil with good, that's being right before God, you have peace. Who here has been um, persecuted this week? I'm the only one? Wow, you guys must be, the world must love you. Yep. Everybody gets persecuted. What do you do? It's easy to talk a big game. Just to keep us honest during this series, the Spirit didn't stop with just the doctrine. Rather, He pressed deeper into our lives, asking us to reflect upon our daily choices, our lifestyles even. And while doing so, He highlighted those moments in time where God was disciplining us. And we learned that this is how He keeps us from straying too far off course. He said, keep your hand on the plow. Go to Hebrews 12, 11. This is where we found the words of our series title, Hebrews 12, 11. So we learned about the way that God keeps us on the straight and narrow, that is discipline, often. Because we're stubborn, we're obstinate. Hebrews 12, 11. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I gave you the amplified up here on the board as well. Hebrews 12, 11, For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems sad and painful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Right standing with God and a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. That's what it means to be righteous, to have a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. That's what it means to be righteous. Certainly not rocket science. So this is how we got our series title, The Peaceful Fruit of Righteousness. Righteousness is a function of obedience, obedience of discipline, often. And when we're right before God, a.k.a. we bear the fruit of righteousness, He blesses us with peace. If we try to usurp God's sovereign right to sanctify us the way He sees fit, our own conscience will suffer. We studied this as well. The very purpose of God's training His children is to lead them to do what is right, and therefore a clear conscience. What's worse than a haunting conscience? What's worse than a defiled conscience? Seriously, what's worse than that? Those are the things, if something's going to keep you up at night, that's what it is. You don't have a clear conscience. Why? Because you're unrighteous before the holy God of the universe. And His Spirit is saying, you're unrighteous before me. And you're like, oh, really? Yeah, that's why we're up talking. So the very purpose of God's training His children is to lead them to do what is right and therefore a clear conscience, and therefore the result of peace in the heart of man. Up here on the board. Peace from living by a good conscience. Remember, Paul's peace was related to his conscience and the way he chose to rightly live before God, including living in the calling of the Great Commission. Paul wrote multiple times about man's conscience before God, including his own up here on the board, Romans 9, verse 1. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. The balance statement, of course, is to ensure that we aren't being guilted into something worldly by the world. 1 Corinthians 4, 4. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. And speaking of the Lord, the world likes to trick us into thinking that it's our feelings that matter most. Ugh. We had at least a whole lesson, probably a lesson and a half on this one. That our feelings are what matters most. You could not be further from the truth. 
You could not be further from the truth. Your emotions never lead truth. Ever. You may have emotional responses that are right before God, like love and appreciation and thanksgiving, and maybe even righteous indignation. But how dare any of us turn to God and say, this doesn't feel right, O holy God of the universe, therefore it is wrong. I have cast my vote. This does not feel right. Even Dr. Phil disagrees. But that's what the world says. You want to know what God thinks? How do you feel, baby? How do you feel, sweetie? How, how, how do you feel? Oh, let's go get a cappuccino and talk about this. Let's talk about God. We won't bring our Bibles. We won't ever use Scripture. We'll just talk about God like He's our friend. Wrong God. That's called the God of this world. The one who's trying to trick you and deceive you from simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's what the world peddles. Feel your way to God. That's a lie. And there's few people, in the, you can ask anybody in my life, there's few people that I know that are more sensitive than myself. So I'm not some emotional rock that's just trying to, I don't know, <laughs> pound things into you. Don't, you know, if you have feelings, you should, you're a sinner. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying don't, don't let your feelings dictate who God is. Because he's the sovereign, not you. Certainly not your ridiculous feelings. Flying by the seat of your pants. Feelings ought to be treated as results, not causes. The cause for spiritual living is, an, is the inerrant truth in the Word of God. While we may experience feelings as a result, we ought never trust our feelings when they contradict Holy Scripture. I've had people tell me very recently, I just got over this thing because it didn't feel right. For decades, I hated the truth, and so I rejected it, and I just got over it. I don't know what it took. Some thing probably over here, some thing unlocked whatever the linchpin was to their obstinance, I guess, or their rejection. And then finally they're free. Like, what the heck? Kind of time wasted, huh? One more point on flying by the seat of your pants. We don't get to feel our way to understanding God. God has already revealed Himself to us through Holy Scripture, through Jesus Christ, the Word. The world says, follow your gut. The Bible says, follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. One last point before we close. You don't have to feel good about obeying God. Wait a minute, what? Yeah, you don't have to feel good about obeying God. It kind of would feel good sometimes to sin. Somebody like, booyah. And when you, <laughs> when you obey God, your flesh is left hanging, isn't it? And you're like, really want to do that thing. I really want to think poorly about this person. I really want to judge that person right now. It's so easy to judge them because they're such jerks. And God's like, no. I hate judges. I hate that whole thing. I hate judging. I hate when you take things into your own hands. Wrath is mine. Vengeance is mine. I hate when you do that stuff. The Bible never tells us that obedience will always be a joyful experience. We just saw that in Hebrews 12, 11 in the Amplified, right? It never tells us obedience will always be a joyful experience in the moment. Rather, it tells us that there are peaceful results. And there's a huge difference. Up here in the void. Peaceful fruit. The gateway to actually experiencing said peace is an obedience, a.k.a. being righteous through the power of the Spirit and His Word, our free will decides on experiential reception of God's peace. When we obey, excuse me, we receive it. Luke 11, 28b, up here on the board. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Again, the warning from the Spirit has been 
up here on the board, earthly righteousness, all points of review as we're closing up, no matter how earnestly it is practiced or even achieved, earthly righteousness has no part in God's peace. You will try to architect your own deliverance uh, has no part in God's peace. The very proposition, the arrogance that it takes to do such a thing, to take on such an endeavor, precludes you from experiencing his peace, at least in that realm of your life. We believers receive his peace as a function of bearing fruit of righteousness. Righteousness! Remember the warning Jesus gave us up here on the board. Hypocrisy. How about hypocrisy according to Jesus? The Greek root of this word hypocrisy means to wear a mask as in a theater. Practicing righteousness for the approbation of others is like wearing a mask. It is disingenuous before God. God does not bless hypocrites. Man does, though. That's what we learn. Peace being a primary blessing from God is among the things that God withholds from hypocrites. He essentially says, well, if the world's, quote, blessing you, that's as good as it's going to get. So enjoy it while you got it, because it's not from me, and it's not eternal, and it has no weight with me. So the things you're doing are wood, hand, straw. They're all going to burn up. All right, back to the big picture before we close. It's simple, and it's pure, because it has everything to do with living in the gospel reality. And here's our last principle I'll leave you with before we close. Sanctification in a nutshell. This is what this is all about, by the way, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Peace is the result of being sanctified. In other words, obedience, humility, obedience, righteousness, peace. The only perspective we can have that delivers us unto His peace is to fully apprehend His salvation. Again, the only perspective we can have that delivers us unto His peace is to fully apprehend His salvation. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful time to gather together as family this evening to learn your word, to keep it simple, to keep it real. We just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned out to a lost and dying world, Father, that needs it so desperately. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.